Thank you for the singing today. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, please, to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. When you find John's Gospel, I want to ask you to turn to the third chapter. The third chapter of John. I'm going to be reading very familiar, just a few verses of a very familiar passage of Scripture in our hearing. John chapter number three. We welcome you. It's good to see all of you this morning in uh, the house of the Lord. And uh, glad to have my doctor back. Dr. Gray, good to see you. Appreciate you being with us today. And I appreciate all of you. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to see you. Thank you for being in your places today. Remember our services tonight. Officers and teachers and bus workers meeting at 6.30, 7 o'clock tonight, uh, our Sunday evening service. This month, we're having different speakers every Sunday night. And tonight, a dear friend of mine for a few years will be here to speak to us. I've had the privilege of working very closely with him over the, in the last year. We've been able to make some great accomplishments in his county, Burke County, North Carolina. And Brother Paul Deal, pastor of Winkler's Grove Baptist Church, he averaged about a thousand people on Sunday morning, will be here to speak this evening. He is a dear friend, and I hope you'll be in your places tonight for our Sunday evening service. John chapter 3, verse number 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. May we pray. Brother Jarvis, would you pray for us, please? Amen. Thank you. There are many times through the years, over half a century of preaching, that in a, in a special way, the Lord places messages upon my heart. Quite honestly, I had labored for a few hours this week in anticipation of this morning's service. But I was awakened this morning at 4 a.m. And this message that I shall share with you for the next few minutes was heavily placed upon my heart. I got out of the bed and from four o'clock on until time to get ready to come, I spent some time meditating, praying, and putting together the message that I share with us today for the, the simple reason, number one, I know it's God's will for this moment. Secondly, I come to this passage of Scripture today and oft times because I believe it presents to us how simple salvation is to the human race. But thirdly, I come before us today and I preach quite frequently on being saved and being born again because I don't want to have to stand someday in the presence of the Lord and the Lord look at me and say, Ron, why did you not spend more time telling people how to be saved? Because the bottom line is and the apex of what my ministry is all about is making sure that everyone I minister to knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is their Savior. Jesus said it this way, What shall it profit a man if a man gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The one thing that you have at your disposal today that is never ending, the one thing that for all of eternity will live on, is your soul. The physical body dies, but our soul lives on forever. And there are only two destinations. 
And everybody listening to me in this building and outside of this building, everyone, man, woman, boy, or girl, it makes no difference, are only one heartbeat away from either heaven or hell. Now that makes this business serious business. And I want to take a few moments today out of this passage of scripture that we are all familiar with, especially John chapter three and verse number 16. And I want to talk to us today about being sure that you are sure. John, who wrote this letter to us, has given us five books in the New Testament. He has given to us, of course, the book we presented as our text verse today, the Gospel of John. He has given to us the book of 1 John and the book of 2 John and the book of 3 John. And he has given us the last book, the final book of the Word of God, the book of the Revelation. There is a key, so-called, found in each one of these letters that John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has given to us that unlocks the meaning of these books. God wanted us to know and to understand why he placed these books in his inspired canon. John, the letter we're reading from today, in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, reminds us why God gave us this book. In the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John and verses 30 and 31, the Bible said in many other signs, truly, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these, the contents of this book, the Gospel of John, are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The purpose of the Gospel of John, if you read it through its entirety, is to teach you and to show you that he was and he is and he forever shall be the Son of the living God and the one who became the sin offering and God's substitute for our sins on the cross of Calvary. And the miracles and the teachings in the Gospel of John are meant to prove to us unquestionably that he is qualified and divinely qualified to be our Savior because the things that he said, the things that he spake, and the things that he did uh, prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is God incarnated in flesh and that his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary is sufficient to save whosoever will choose to call upon his name. Not only did John give us this book to teach us how to be saved, but then after a person has trusted Christ as their Savior, they have his other writing, the book of 1 John, to help them to know and to understand and to appreciate the fact that once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can know beyond any doubt, hesitation, or reservation that you are indeed truly saved and that you can know so. In the book of 1 John chapter number 5, John again writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit said in verses 12 and 13, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, catch this phrase, that ye may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So the Gospel of John was written to help us know how to be saved. First John was written to help us to know that we are saved without a shadow of doubt, hesitation, or reservation. I'm glad that being saved is not a shot in the dark. 
I'm glad that going to heaven uh, is not a hope so or a maybe so or could be or if our good outweighs our bad uh, or if we've joined enough churches and been baptized in enough farm ponds uh, and we know the names of all of the tadpoles in the farm, uh, then may, farm pond, then maybe we can have the assurance of our salvation. It doesn't work that way. We have the assurance of unchanging word, the unchangeable word of God uh, that we can know so that we are saved. Now, I want you to understand, here was a man who was a religious man, Mr. Nicodemus, but he was a downcast man. He was a seeking individual. He was searching for the truth. And he had heard about the Lord Jesus Christ. No, he could have possibly said under his teachings. Uh, but Jesus, uh, he came to Jesus one night on the cobblestone streets uh, of, of Jerusalem. Uh, and he said, Master, we know that thou art a man sent from God. And the Lord looked at Mr. Nicodemus uh, and he said unto him, uh, Mr. Nicodemus, uh, ye must be born again. Now that phrase is used here in the third chapter. It is also used in the book of First Peter uh, on at least two different occasions. Uh, here's what God did. God put the message down on the bottom shelf so that we could understand it. Now there are many illustrations in the Bible that has to do with salvation. Uh, for instance, the Bible says that being saved uh, is kind of like a shepherd and his sheep in John chapter number 10. But not everybody knows uh, about shepherding. Not everybody's been around shepherds and sheep. There are people in parts of the world, uh, they only know what they've read. They've never been on the spot. They've never been in that type of environment. The Bible also says in John chapter number 15 that it's kind of like a vine and the branches. Uh, but a lot of people have never been in a vineyard. And a lot of people have never been... Uh, uh, in other places uh, uh, across the world uh, that might be illustrations uh, of what salvation is. But everybody has had a birth. Now we may not understand and we don't all of the ramifications of birth. We had two recently born children up here on the pulpit stage just a few minutes ago. Not everybody may understand the ramifications of it, but when you use the phrase birth, everybody knows what you're talking about. If somebody says they had a new birth, you don't say, what in the world is that? I've never heard that word birth before. God used a phrase, a phraseology. God used an illustration that you go anywhere in the world uh, and you say birth, immediately everyone knows what you are saying. The Lord put it on a level where we can understand it, where we would not have to die lost, and go into eternity because we do not understand the simplicity of salvation. Now, what does it mean to be born again? Two things right up front. Number one, it means to be born from above. Secondly, it means to be born again. Born from above. Now, everybody in this building listening to my voice and everybody listening through our radio station and our media ministries and our uh, television ministry here in a week or two who view this program, every single one of us, we have at least one thing in common. We have been born. We have had a fleshly birth. All of us have. No one I'm talking to today was hatched out from under a rock. No, not a single person listening to me today evolved in the darkened caverns of a cave somewhere where several thousand million years ago, a bunch of little germs got together and they started, uh, they started uh, coming together and they had, uh, they had uh, the descendants and then they had descendants and then they had descendants. And finally, they stood up and walked on their two hind legs out of a darkened cavern. No, it didn't happen that way at all. Everybody listening to my voice, we have had one birth, at least one birth. I am hoping today that everybody listening to me has had the second birth. 
if you have the first birth, you may have to die twice. If you've had the second birth, you'll only have to die once and possibly not even have to die once to, because everybody's had the second birth is going to have a free ride to heaven when the trumpet sounds and the church is lifted out of this world. We call that the harpazo, the rapture of the church. Now it's my desire, it's my hope that everybody listening to me again has not only had your fleshly birth, your first birth, but you've had a second birth from above. Now Jesus illustrates it. I want you to see it here in your Bible. The illustration of the new birth. Look with me please in verse number five of our chapter. Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now there are two births set forth in this verse of scripture. There's the water birth and there is the physical birth and spiritual birth. Now listen to me closely. Listen closely. I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. There's a lot of false doctrines and a lot of false belief systems out there. But this right here forever sets it straight. Because not only does he speak about these two births, but he gives us two illustrations as to what it means to be born from above or born again. Look at it in verse 5. There is first of all, he that is born of water. Now what in the world is that talking about? You say, preacher, you must believe uh, in water baptism because you've got a baptistry back there. It's not talking about water baptism. You can get in the shower and use Drano. But you'll never get clean enough to go to heaven. You can go into that baptistry until you bubble. But you'll never go in that baptistry enough to get to heaven. You'll never go in a creek bed. You'll never go in a pond. You'll never go in a lake. You'll never go in a creek. You'll never go in the ocean enough to get your sins washed away. He tells us what the water birth is in the very next verse, verse number six. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. What is the water birth he's talking about? The fleshly birth, because next verse, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Everybody in this building has had that first birth, that fleshly birth. But there's a second birth if we get to heaven in verse number six that we must have. That which is born of the flesh is earth. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's the spiritual birth. It's an illustration of the previous verse. First of all, our birth into this world. That's birth number one. Secondly, our birth in the world to come when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Let me just stop here and analyze this. That means we realize we're a sinner. That means that we recognize that we can't go to heaven with that sin tagged into our life. And so we come by faith. We say to the Lord Jesus Christ, for whosoever shall call upon the Lord, name of the Lord shall be saved. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. It means we come to that place where, yes, I realize I'm a sinner. I have broken God's law. I have come short of God's glory. And Lord, I'm asking you right now to forgive me of my sins. I receive you right now as my personal Savior. And the transaction of justification takes place. And you are heaven bound. And earth, uh, hell is no longer your destination. When you have that spiritual birth. Now, let me illustrate it. I read a story not too long ago about an uneducated individual who went to a Salvation Army meeting. He'd been going for quite some time. He was a seeker. He realized something was wrong in his life that needed to be righted. He knew that he needed to have this experience from God to have his sins forgiven, but he didn't know how to go about doing it. So he went to the Salvation Army meeting. And when he came home, he was highly upset. And his wife said, honey, what's wrong with you? He said, well, all of the people over to the Salvation Army, they are wearing red sweaters. He said, I don't have one. 
She said, well, honey, that's no problem. I'll knit you a red sweater. So she knitted him a red sweater. And in the process of time, he put his red sweater on and he went over to the Salvation Army meeting. If you see them out, uh, you'll see them out this holiday. They've got their little bells. Most of them have the red sweater. That's a type. That's a characteristic of the Salvation Army soldiers. So uh, he came back after he wore his red sweater, but nothing had happened in his heart. He was still carrying his burden. He still had the load of sin. She said, honey, you still look dejected. Can you tell me, please, what's going on? Said, well, I'll tell you. I didn't notice, but all of those people over there that have on red sweaters, they have yellow writing on them. She said, well, honey, don't worry about it. Uh, I'll embroider some yellow writing on your sweater. So since she was uneducated and since she couldn't read and he couldn't read, uh, she got his red sweater. She got her paraphernalia out. And she said, now, what am I going to put on this red sweater that's yellow? And she looked out the window of their apartment and there was a place of business across the street. And she noticed that there was a sign on that place of business. And so she looked at that sign and uh, she put that lettering that she'd seen on that sign, although she didn't understand it. Uh, she said he wants yellow lettering on that red sweater. Right there, some lettering right across the street at this place of business. I'll put what's on that sign right here on his red sweater. So the next Sunday... He went to the Salvation Arm meeting and he came back home and he was happy and he was jubilant. And she said, well, you look happier. Did they like your sweater? Oh, he said, like my sweater. He said, they love my sweater. Uh, some of them said, we even like your sweater better than our sweaters. Now, what neither of them two people knew because they couldn't read was that she took a slogan off of the business, the sign on the business across the street from them, which says, this business under new management. <laughs> he went down there and he said, I'm under new management. Now, my friend, that's exactly what happens to you when you get born again. You are under new management. What makes the difference? Because Jesus said here, born of water, watch this, and born of the Spirit. When the Spirit of God comes in and convicts you and you cry out for mercy and say, yes, Lord Jesus, I want you to save me, you come under new management. The devil is no longer in charge of your life. You should no longer be in charge of your life. You have turned your life over under new management to the one who died on Calvary's cross, to the one that held out his hands and said, it's finished. The plan of salvation is complete. And now that load of sin and condemnation and shame can be forgiven and lifted. And you can feel as clean as if you had never committed a single sin in your life because the cross of Calvary takes away the sin from the sinner. Now, Jesus gave us an illustration of it here in the third chapter. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, verse 14, even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. What does that mean? Well, the people out in the wilderness were baptistic. They started murmuring and grumbling and complaining and griping. And God sent fire serpents in their presence and bit them. And they're dying by the hundreds. And the people are dying by the thousands. And Moses went before God and God said, here's what you do. And they took a fiery serpent made out of uh, some type of material, gold. And they placed it bra at brass and placed it up on that tall pole. And it's amazing what they made to put on that pole was a serpent. The serpent that caused the human race to falter and fail in the Garden of Eden. And God said to them, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall look upon that serpent shall be made whole. In other words, if you're dying, look and live. You don't have to 
sell small tokens of the brazen serpent. You don't have to open up a business and sell books about the brazen serpent because that constitutes works. It shall come to pass that whosoever look, looks upon that brazen serpent shall be made whole. The, the death sentence will be lifted. And just as he lifted up that brazen serpent, so Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross of Calvary because we too had been bitten by the corruption of sin and shame and degradation and separation from our Creator. But Jesus came to span the tide. And the truth of the matter is that whosoever looketh upon the Lord Jesus Christ, calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, shall be saved. Oh, thank God the price has been paid. We couldn't pay it. If we had 10 million years, it would be impossible for us to do it. We've been bitten by sin, but Jesus became the uplifted Savior. And whosoever looketh on him, whosoever believeth upon him, shall be made whole. Now, what is the meaning of being born again? What is the meaning of regeneration? Let me say, first of all, that it is a definite experience, just like being birthed into this world. Notice what he said. Notice what he said. You must be born again. That means there's a first birth in order to say a second birth, born again. Now, if you are sitting in this building or listening to my voice today, and you don't know you've had a birth, we need to check your temperature. You may be delirious. Because the truth is, all of us sitting in this building understand we've had a physical birth. As according to John chapter 3, being born again is as definite an experience as being born the first time. Born in the flesh and born above. In other words, if you're saved today, I use this as an illustration, you can say this. I was born in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. You pick out the state, you pick out the place, but you can say, also, I was born in, you pick it out, Dallas, Texas. I was born in Winston-Salem physically. I was born in Dallas, Texas spiritually. Only people who are saved can talk about two births. Now, the world don't understand that. The world will look at you cross-eyed. The world will look at you wall-eyed. The world will look, look at you with eyes closed because they don't believe it's possible for you to have two births. But the second birth is just as real as the first birth. Because the second birth is according to the Word of God. And we believe the Word of God by faith. We know that God cannot lie. And just as we sit here today, knowing that we've experienced a physical birth, we know that we can have a second birth by coming God's way, believing on what the Word of God says, calling upon His name, asking Him to forgive us, asking Him to save us. A second birth takes place. Now, Nicodemus didn't understand it. He said, how can this be? Can a man enter into his mother's womb the second time and be born again? Oh, and Jesus said, no, no, Mr. Religious Leader, it's not that way at all. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. There's the fleshly birth. If you are saved, there's the spiritual birth. Each of those births are real, genuine births. And if you've experienced both of those births, you understand what I'm saying. And you understand the language that I'm sharing with you at this point. Because the first birth introduces us to planet Earth. And the second birth introduces us to heaven, the country that is to come. Amen. Well, praise someone asked D.L. Moody one time. They said, Mr. Moody, give us a resume of your life. He said, my name is D.L. Moody. I was born of the flesh in 1837. I was born of the Spirit in 1856. He said, the first birth will terminate someday. But he said, that birth, second birth that I got in 1856 
will never terminate. He said, someday you will read in the obituary column of the paper that D.L. Moody has died. He said, don't you believe a word of it. Because at that point, I will be more alive than I've ever been in all of my life. Because when that takes place, I'm just changing worlds and continuing to live on in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's good to have two births. Let me say that it's not only a definite experience. But let me say secondly, it's an instantaneous experience. Now, I want you to listen closely because this is vitally important. Born again, we call it also regeneration. It's the word we get gene. Look at regeneration, regene. When you're born the first time, you get handed to you genes that cause us to act the way we act, identify with the people we identify with. Being born again is regene, regeneration. You get regene from above when you get saved. Brother Beatty, that's good preaching. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Regeneration is an instantaneous experience. Now, I come from the background, to some degree, not completely, but I've been around some old meetings, earlier days of my life, when somebody would come forward to the altar, and I'm thinking right now about camp meetings, and they come forward in the shavings, and they get around the uh, camp meeting altar, and when they did, a half a dozen, sometimes a dozen or more, people flock around them and start praying, nothing against that. Thank God for people who come and pray with people who have spiritual needs. I'm not against that. I'm for that. 100% for it. However, I've been around and I'd see somebody come and I'd see a group of people come and get around them. And somebody's punching them on one side in the ribs and they're saying, turn loose. And somebody's on the other side punching them and said, give up. And they're telling them to do all kinds of different things. I even heard a person say uh, I don't know, not too long ago, he said, I tried for two or three weeks, agonizing with God to get saved, for God to receive me. No, no, no. People have the wrong idea about what salvation is. Salvation is not something you work to do, to perform over a period of hours, over a period of days, over a period of weeks, over a period of years. Salvation is instantaneous when you come before God in all of your sincerity of heart. God at that moment instantaneously receives you and forgives you into his family. Oh, yeah, yeah. Regeneration is, is, is an instantaneous. Notice, if you will, you're in the third chapter of John. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Look at verse 16. Here's the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him, watch this, should not perish but have. My friend, that's present tense. Not could have. Not might have. Not if you work hard enough could have. If you get baptized enough times might have. But the moment you look at Jesus and you call upon Jesus and you believe upon Jesus to have your sins forgiven in order that you can go to heaven when death overtakes you, when you call upon his precious high and holy name, it's instantaneous. God receiveth sinners when sinners receiveth him. But have, but have, present tense, eternal life. Like many of you, I have a gas grill at home. When I get ready to fix those hamburgers, Richard, and hot dogs, I feel sorry for you because you've had to give them up because of health problems. 
but you taste them by faith now. <laughs> but when I get ready to grill some hamburgers or hot dogs, I turn the gas on. I got a little button I push. It causes a spark. And when I push that button, go boom. Instantly. That fire ignites inside of that grill. I forgot one day that I had turned an extra burner on. And I turned, I remembered having the one on I was concerned about. And I hit that button and went kaboom. And I started to walk off. And I got part of the way across the porch. And all of a sudden, I thought somebody was behind me with a gun. That thing went off. I'm just glad it didn't explode. But when that gas hit that spark, kafoom, it's lit. When you call upon the name of the Lord, this is country saying, now hang with me, I'm putting it down on the bottom shelf. When you come upon the, but before the Lord and call upon his precious and holy name, kafoom. Immediately. Immediately. Without hesitation, without reservation, without waiting. When you call upon the name of the Lord, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall instantaneously be saved. And whosoever believeth on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ hath, present tense, right now, eternal life. Let me say this in closing, and as you know, I never get finished. But let me say this. Regeneration is a spiritual experience. Listen closely. I'm finished. Vitally important. Regeneration is a spiritual experience. Regeneration, and here's where a lot of people are dropping the ball, is not reformation. Regeneration is not turning over a leaf. I read one day where a socialist was standing on a street corner. And the socialists said, if you will endorse socialism, and of course they're trying, hoping that they can introduce socialism, more of it in America at this very moment. God help, help us that we don't get it. But the socialist stood on the street corner. And he said, if you will embrace socialism, he'll put a new coat on the man. There was a young man standing in the crowd who came out of a life of sin, shame, and debauchery. He was an alcoholic. He had spent most of his savings and most of his salary and was in the process of spending it on alcohol, liquor, wildlife. But in the most recent days, he had gotten saved and trusted Christ as his personal Savior. He was standing in the crowd. He happened to see a crowd. He decided to see what was happening. He heard the socialists say, if you will embrace socialism, socialism will put a new coat on your shoulders. That man raised his hand in the crowd and said, hey, sir, I've got something to say to you. You say that socialism will put a new coat on your shoulders. He said, it hadn't been long since I trusted Christ as my Savior. I want you to understand that trusting Christ, getting born again, puts a new man in the coat. Amen. Salvation is not reformation. It is not turning over a new leaf. It is not a New Year's uh, re revolution, resolution. A resolution that you're going to have a revolution. If you want to have a revolution, bless God, trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Then you start renouncing what you used to love. And you start loving what you used to hate. When Jesus Christ becomes your Savior. Spiritual experience. And let me say this, and I'm finished. I think I said that a moment ago, but I'm serious. I'm finished. Regeneration. Listen closely. Regeneration is an experience. Listen, regeneration is an experience. I want you to hear this. I'm saying it over and over. When everybody looks like you're here listening, I, get, I'll, I'll move on. Regeneration is an experience that lasts forever. 
It'll last forever. Why? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That fleshly birth will last as long as you live in this world. You might get married and you say, wow, I wish that guy could be reborn. I wish that lady could be reborn. Sorry. Bingo. It don't happen as long as you're living and breathing. You're going to have a physical birth. You're going to have the flesh. But the spiritual birth, when you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, has no end of duration. Scripture, proof text. I want you to notice with me verse 15 of chapter 3. Notice closely what the Bible says just before that great verse 16. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting, eternal life. What kind of life does Jesus give? He gives his life. What is his life? When he got up on the other side of the grave on resurrection morning, he got up with a life that will never cease, it will never end, it is a forever life. And that is the life you and I receive the moment we receive him as our personal Savior. He is our life. And the Bible said, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. Wow. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He didn't say temporal life, but everlasting life. The life that you receive the moment you get saved is his unending life. It is the life that he gives us that continues on forever without interruption. It is the life that he gives us that is unchanged by time. Everything around us is changing. Time changes things. But the life that we receive from the Lord Jesus Christ never changes. It was with me when I got up at four o'clock this morning. It'll be with me when I go to bed at night. Whatever time. And it'll be with me when I wake up in the morning. And when I close my eyes in death, and when you close your eyes in death, that life is not affected by death. That life is the life that assures us in that moment that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord Jesus Christ because we have been made recipients of unending life. Hallelujah. You must be born again. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I do not question why the Lord woke me up at four o'clock this morning. There's somebody possibly in this building or listening through our media that's been dragging around for a long time the weight of your sins. And to be quite honest, you're just one miserable person because you're afraid to die. You're uncomfortable. You look at people you believe are really Christians and they're so vastly different than you are. And you just come to the place in your life where you say, I'm tired of this. I want what the Bible teaches. I want my sins forgiven. I want Christ to become my Savior. I want the life that Jesus Christ gives. I want to be born again. And as we have the invitation, I want to ask you, you may be saved and know it, but you may have problems in your life. There may be difficulties. There may be something today that's bothering you. You ought to get around this altar. Shouldn't have to be pumped or primed or begged. If the Spirit of God is doing His work in your life, and only you know that, only you can understand that, then you should be responsive to the mercy and the grace of God that He's allowed you to live for another opportunity that the Spirit of God might be able to speak to you. 
Father, I pray now that you minister to us during this invitation and help people to respond to what they feel the Spirit of God is doing within their very bosom, their very being. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. We sing a stanza. If you, others need to come, would you come?